Hello, I'm Doug Musio. This is City Talk and the second part of my conversation with William Grimes about my favorite subject, food. Bill and I will then talk about my not so favorite subject, death. Bill Grimes was the restaurant critic for the New York Times from 1999 to 2004. He then wrote book reviews for the paper before becoming an obituary writer in 2008. He is the author of Straight Up Around the Rocks, My Feathered Friend, Eating Your Words, and co-author of The New York Times Guide to New York City Restaurants. Welcome back, Bill. Thank you for having me. Last week, we talked about this absolutely wonderful gustatory tour, Appetite City, A Culinary History of New York. Today, let's talk about your role as the restaurant critic, food reviewer, whatever you were for the New York Times, mm -hmm. and the larger issue of criticism and food criticism. And then let's talk about obituaries and obituary writing. Let's start with restaurant critic. How did you become the restaurant critic at the Times. What was sort of your career path that led to that? Well, it was, uh, I had been, uh, when they started up the dining section as a standalone mm -hmm. section in uh, 1997, there was a, an editor who formulated it and or put it together, and he approached me, and he'd read some of the travel pieces I'd written okay. for the paper, as well as this uh, history of the American cocktail straight up on the rocks. And he said, you know, I, I like this, and I, how would you like to uh, write about food full time? And I, ha I was at one of those periods, I was in the culture section of the paper, and I was kind of thinking about the next thing, and this sounded appealing. So I did that for about a year and a half. I was writing large feature articles for the dining section. And then Ruth Reichel, the restaurant critic at the time, left to become editor of Gourmet. That left it open, an open chair. And... Uh, a search was undertaken, uh -oh. and suddenly I noticed people looking at me in a funny way. Uh, I thought I was going to help them with this search for the next great person, right? And uh, then suddenly I saw these meaningful looks being uh -oh. shot at you me. You are the next. Great I, person. Yeah, I got called into the uh, the uh, editor of the style section, is what the style department, and he pulled me in there and said, "Well, you know, have you ever thought about uh, doing this?" And I was resistant to the idea at first, believe it or not. I but I, as I thought, Why? Um, you know, if you love to eat, it's a big leap from doing that to being on a forced march and eating night after night after night and having to weigh in on it. And, <laughs> and, you know, and a couple of senses. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and uh, it's, uh, it's sort of like everybody likes to go to a party, right? But do you want to go to a party six nights a week? Fun, fun isn't so much fun when you do it that right. way. So there were, you know, some thoughts came through my mind, and then I thought, I'm out of my mind. This is the best job in the world. So you worked there nearly five years. Mm -hmm. You did 438 reviews, and you ate 1,200 meals. I believe that's the tabulated official count, something like that. Yes. Oh. Talk to me about the nature of the food, dining, restaurant critic's role. What do you see as your role? And talk about sort of the history of food journalism, if you will. Well, I, you know, I loved writing about this in Appetite City. It was one of the more interesting facets of the whole of the whole uh, history of food in New York because you nobody knows about the food unless somebody's writing about it. Right. And that took a long time in New York. The first restaurant guide did not come along until 1903, uh, which is almost unbelievable because there was a highly evolved dining scene in the city, and you would have thought there would have been a, a market for this. There were city guidebooks, and sure. within city guidebooks there would be a certain amount of information about restaurants and food. But uh, as far as what we you know, an actual restaurant guide, 1903. And then there wasn't another one until 1925 when the architecture critic for The New Yorker moonlighted and just wrote something called The Restaurants of New York. And food journalism in the newspapers tended to be not what we know 
there were no food critics in the newspapers. There were women's page editors mm -hmm. who produced recipes, and sometimes they didn't really cover restaurants as as food news. If there was a fire and a restaurant burned down, well, it would be metropolitan news. But the food itself the, was not news. No, it was not considered something that you would cover. And it, it was really Craig Claiborne at the New York Times, who started out a gourmet, actually, and who kind of sidled into it by a series of inspired accidents. I mean, he was appointed the, um, the head to, to run the news food news section, which was normally a woman's page uh -huh. in the paper. And he had journalistic instincts that led him to cover restaurants in a way that hadn't been covered before. And, and then he started reviewing them. And it became formalized over time. First, he would just review them occasionally as he was interested in a new restaurant. Sure. Then he began to formalize it and decide, well, let's assign stars to it to give them a grade, and let's do it every week. And this didn't happen until the early 60s. And in fact, there have been really quite few restaurant dining critics for the times. You're Just a in handful. A short, short line. A very short line of succession. And very, very different types of critics, at least in terms of this, you know, amateurs reading of it. Some you described your successor in, in Appetite City as being more warm and fuzzy and interested in the com conversation. I think you, you describe your, your style as cooler and more analytical. Yeah. And then in an interview or in one of your pieces, you talk about your success. Talk about the different styles of, for example, Times food critics and the different orientations one can have. Well, I think the, the thing about criticism is you, you bring to it who you are. You... Uh, you're giving people not just a neutral description of restaurants and what you ate. You're serving up yourself. You're seeing it through the, the prism of your own tastes and inclinations and your sense of humor and your sense of uh, uh, not being amused by the food, whatever. It's uh, what people want in, in any kind of criticism, it seems to me, is, is not... They want information, and that's kind of the journalistic mission sure. in American food criticism is what they call service journalism. W what is this place? Where? What are they serving? How much does it cost? Very practical questions like that. Right. But in addition, some um, filtered through a temperament. And I think what you bring is your particular temperament. And those change as, as much as, you know, as different as people are from one another. That's how different the criticism is. What are the similarities? What, what can you see or one can uh, a discerning observer see that is similar or universal among food critics, if anything? Well, it should be a palate, you know, someone who, someone who has a, a zest for eating out. Uh, and you'd be surprised how many people seem not to have that oh, and write about <laughs> Oh, absolutely. And, but I, I, as I went through both your reviews in Appetite City, I've got these little post-its, and then they say, Oh, my God, which means that I've, you know, I've come across one of your mouth-watering, saliva-inducing. Mm -hmm. uh, do you react that way? Now, you don't do restaurant criticism, criticism anymore. No, but you I'm go out, out to eat. But I certainly continue are to eat. Are you still a critic? Sure. I think everybody's a critic. Anybody who goes into a restaurant has an. This is why people like to read restaurant criticism. They're all restaurant critics. Okay. Either it's just like politics. You're right. Either you know they 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 have opinions about. It. They're not afraid to have opinions about it because they know and understand sure. food at some level. They might be afraid to talk about a novel. They might be shy yep. to step forward and say, well, I think this about this director, this film director, mm -hmm. or this about this novel. But nobody's shy about saying whether they liked something they just ate. I mean, that's, it's, uh, it hits at a very fundamental human level. You walk into a restaurant. Now, let's say you don't know the rest. Well, I mean, do you ever go into a restaurant that you don't know? How do you choose restaurants? Oh, sure. Sometimes simply because I'm hungry and there, it's there. It's there, and the door's open. Okay, so. so you walk in the door, and what what are you what are you thinking? What are you looking for? What is what is it? Uh, the first thing is how am I greeted? Uh, particularly if I've made a reservation, do are they? acting like they've never heard of me before, and yet I've made a reservation and they're kind of looking through the book 
and looking as though they're hoping not to find your name so they can say you don't have a reservation go away uh, there are restaurants that are like this can you believe it they're in the hospitality business and, uh, yeah, but and they're that's looking snob. they're looking to uh, alienate you right off the bat but, it, but isn't that snob but, but if you yes yeah, it's, it's snob and sometimes it's disorganization okay. and, and it's a bad sign when you okay. go up there and people seem confused about who's going to be leading you to the table and who's doing that or, or the hostess well, it has nothing to do with at, food the, yet nothing this is to do all with management food. no it's all management Operations. It, it's um, the business of making you feel that you're welcome and you're going to be treated well. And a lot of restaurants blow it in, in that first initial encounter. As they wow. say, you don't have a second chance to make a first impression. Okay, so, so. you're actually seated. What do you – go ahead, describe this. Well, I'm seated and uh, a lot of it has to do with proper timing of not feeling rushed, but not also not that you're twiddling your thumbs and waiting – the wrong amount of time for the appetizer to arrive right. or the interval between appetizer and main course, all that should have a certain flow to it and a sense of proper timing that, co that coincides with you know, sure. people's normal levels of hunger. I, this may be not a question to you. How does the waiter know your individual or a table's individual timing versus other individuals and other people's timing? Well, they can watch. They should okay. have an eye. They, it's constant snooping, a constant sidelong glance to see how empty is your wine glass halfway down or three quarters of the now way down. Now, are you looking at them, looking at you? No, I'm no, I'm not doing anything that obvious. I'm, but I, oh, okay. but I You're know, but I know how often they're coming to my table okay. and whether they okay. whether my wine glass has been empty for five minutes okay. and I have to reach across for the bottle to okay. to, to fill it myself, okay. or whether I've waited. I'm sitting here waiting ten minutes and the and and the. The menu hasn't even appeared. That kind of thing. Okay, now, the menu. What do you What do you look for in a menu? Well, depending on the kind of restaurant it is, I like to see a menu that doesn't is not a list of the current cliches. Of uh, you know, I can't tell you how tired I got of tuna tartare eating out. It was just on every menu, and it's not really. It's kind of hard to make that an exciting appetizer. And it just kept, you know, hitting me between the eyes every place I went, uh, that and fried calamari. And it was, uh, I like to see um, an intelligent menu. And it, intelligence is expressed in different ways at different price levels. I think diner, you can have an intelligent menu at a diner and you can have an intelligent menu at uh, Le Bernardin. And uh, that, uh, that means a well-chosen array of types of food and at um, at price points that allow you to get away without spending a fortune, uh -huh. allowing you to splurge if you want to splurge. Same thing with the wine list, you know, that it's uh, geared what, toward. Do you have any tendencies in ordering? For example, do you order stuff that you've never heard of before or considered before? Or, I mean, is there a particular... Bill Grimes' approach to eating? Well, as a restaurant reviewer, there definitely was. Go ahead. Would be a, I would go usually with a party of four, and everybody had to order something different. Okay. Four different appetizers. Okay. Four different entrees. This is all anonymous, four obviously. All anonymous, but I wanted to eat as much of the menu as possible. Right. So everybody, right. everybody ordered something different, and they had to share with me. Right. Because I would have to have a little bite or two from oh, everybody right. to be able to work through as much of the menu as possible. Sure. Uh, if you go to a the minimum number of times you go to a restaurant is three before you can file a review at the okay. time. So if you go with a party of four and you go three times and everybody's ordering something different every wow, time. Wow, that's a lot. You can go through sure. even a fairly substantial menu. Wow. You can taste pretty much everything. Okay, I didn't know this. What is the, the, the largest number of visits you've done or you did before you wrote a review? Uh, for the four-star ones, when I was thinking of giving a four stars, mm -hmm. I I think that you have to ponder long and think hard before you do that. And I would often make repeat, like, you know, six, seven visits wow. sometimes. Wow. Your first four-star restaurant. What was your first four-star review? Um, and Dave, what did you eat? <laughs> uh, well, it's go been ahead. a while. I, had to go, I would have to go back to my uh, no, notes, no, no, I think. No, no, no. Go but, ahead. Uh, when David Boulay moved from, uh, he was... This was supposed to be kind of a holding operation when he went to Boulay Bakery. And this is one of these super chefs. He's a super chef. Okay. There's and no we'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit, but go ahead. But he was in a sort of interim phase where he was planning the next, uh, the next leap forward in his restaurant empire. He was at Boulay Bakery, and this was really not intended in a way to be a four-star restaurant. But I ate there a few times, and I started thinking, well, 
you know, if this isn't four star cuisine, I don't know what is. Right. So uh, I uh, I gave it four stars. What was the four star restaurants must come in two types. The ones that you sort of expect, you know, you would expect mm -hmm. it to be four stars, and I'm sure you're disappointed sometimes. But what are the ones where you, uh, in addition to the first one, that you didn't expect it at, at all? It came as a surprise that you walked out, or you, you didn't even walk out. You knew it then. Well, I don't think four stars come as big surprises because they tend to be uh, restaurants that are enormously. Uh, that have massive investments in them and the chefs okay. are, are renowned. So, um, I, you know, the ones that I gave four stars to were Danielle okay. uh, and uh, Alain Ducasse. And Ducasse, I think, was a surprise only to this extent, that I'd given him three stars when he opened. Same was true of Danielle, for example, as a matter of fact. But Ducasse, who really had a rough ride in New York, and I helped give him a rough ride. But I... Um, purely by accident. Uh, he had a, uh, a, a lunch menu that he revised, and I wanted to check it out. And I went in with no thought that I was going to re-review the restaurant. Right. And I was so stunned by the menu that I decided, okay, you come back. I, I'm going to come back okay. and see whether this restaurant has turned the corner here. And, it's, and I did give it four stars. Disappointment? I mean, in, in the reviews that I read, and I, I, I read a few, but not obviously, obviously not your, the, the 438 of them, what, in a sense, what was what was the, your worst dining experience, and, that, and then what was reflected in the review, and why? Well, I mean, there's some big flameouts, and I think the revised, uh, the redecorated Russian tea room when Warner Leroy oh, took it over. Oh man, you really that do was, a number uh, on it. I, 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 I did a number on that. I thought it was a spectacular crash and burn that had to be covered as such. Uh, there were other ones that uh, there was a, a sort of annoyingly hip place called Hudson Cafeteria that opened and it was attempted to be, uh, it was one of these things serving retro dishes like chop suey and meatloaf and you were supposed to feel cool while you're eating it and I found the whole exercise <laughs> to be pointless and annoying and I expressed that in the review. How did, how did you, how do you select or how did you select restaurants? I mean, some of it's just word of mouth. Is, is there any, is there any policy, if you will, implicit or explicit? No, there's no policy. There is, um, there is the what news. Criteria? There's the news. Uh, there are criteria there in the sense that it's a newspaper and you're reporting on food news. And so when a restaurant of a certain magnitude opens, you know that there's, there's um, an eagerness out there. Sure. People want to know, well, what's the deal with this restaurant? Right. They want to hear about it. So that's purely news judgment. You have enormous latitude at the paper to, to review what you want to review. Common sense tells you that when um, oh, Jeffrey Zakarian opened a, a very fine restaurant called Town, uh, this was a period when a lot of hotels were going up when I was a uh, restaurant critic. Yeah, I was, gonna, I, was, I, I was quite fortunate in that. It was yeah, a, kind of ask, a boom period. Yeah. And Town was one of those really fine ones. Well, you didn't have to be a genius to know that you were going to review Town fairly early on, as okay. was anybody who was interested in food in New York. You were, you were the, the critic, at, 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 in some senses, in the best of times. Mm. This confluence of so many different things, the internationalization, the super chefs, the food mm -hmm. network, I mean, the technology, all of it. Talk about what was going on in that, in that five-year period and what, what, what has remained and what, is, what was ephemeral and faddish. Well, there were, um, I would say there were certain megatrends that st are still with us, and that you've alluded to uh, internationalization, fusion cuisine, global cuisine. The, the, what Mexican-Moroccan the, food, for example. Yeah, I mean, what this, I mean, some of it's silly, but some of it is some just of inevitable. Some of delicious, right. And some of it is, is, is wonderful, and what it reflects is something that's not going to change, which is that people travel more, that chefs have access to ingredients by overnight delivery that they could never have gotten before. And third, that they're trained in a different way. Uh, Jean-Georges Van Gerichten is the, the chef he is because he was sent to Bangkok to open a restaurant. And uh, now what chef, French chef would have done that 20 years earlier? It would not have happened. Mm -hmm. Simply would, That exposed him to a world he knew nothing about, opened his eyes. He was a, you know, a, a fabulously well-trained chef in the French classical tradition. That's something they still know how to do. And he began thinking about, well, look at these ingredients. They have nothing to do with French cuisine, but 
you know, I'm someone who's as a curious tasting chef, what do I do with this? And the answer is in, you know, what he brought back to New York. Do you cook? And yes, do I do. you cook to your satisfaction as a critic? Well, you no, know, if I, if I were reviewing myself, you know, I would, uh, I'd be very, well, I don't have to review myself. My wife reviews. Oh, okay. <laughs> she, what does she say? She says, uh, she says, uh, she's my, uh, when I'm, when I do something well, she'll be the first one to say it. But there's lots of a, a lot of picky criticism around my table. Ooh, I have to say, oh, we, we, we would have. She's a much better cook than I am. She has a uh, you know more finesse, more. Uh, oh, you see, you, better hands. Yes, that was so. a good comeback because you were mm -hmm. just in deep trouble. One of the things that struck me looking at the period that you were the critic and and and, and reading the book is. The rapidity at which neighborhoods become hot. I mean, you do it in a historical sense, but in your five years, the Lower East Side, Changed. the Meatpacking District, the, when you started in 99, the end of the 90s, come on, it was nothing. No. And when you left, it was hot. Yes. What does it? Real estate does it. Do you... Uh if you want to open a restaurant, the first question you have is, where am I going to open it? Right. And the second question is, where can I afford to open it? And the real estate map of New York pushes you into this this direction or that direction. Mm -hmm. Those places uh, it's, were um, available because the rent, you know, it was possible to get leases that sure, were not just like the, crucifyingly expensive. Right, sure. And, sure. And you then you get this kind of combination of you get a hip restaurant like uh, 71 Clinton Fresh Food on Clinton Street right. that becomes a magnet for a certain kind of diner, a very hip, young yeah. diner. Yep. And then you get this synergy going where because that kind of diner is there, that encourages another restaurant in the same vein to open there and other businesses that reflect that kind of sensibility. And pretty soon you have a whole neighborhood that's being defined in a way, by the restaurants that are there and the way people eat. People don't think of the power. One thing I realized in researching this book was the power of restaurants to shape neighborhoods. It's a, yeah, I, and, and, and for me, as sort of a student of cities, particularly of New York, that was striking. It's almost a textbook. Let me just quote, before we move on very briefly to writing obituaries, you talk about the relationship between the critic and, 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 the, and, and the reader. You quote, it takes time for readers to get used to a new critic, to assess his quirks and predilections, to mark out the boundaries of agreement and disagreement, and to develop confidence in or contempt for the judgments being served up every week, and the relationship can't be just brushed. It's a very nice sort of statement of the relationship between a lot of readers and reviewers, whether it's theater, mm -hmm. food, etc. Let's it's, move on. It can be very right. personal. Yeah, it can be very personal. And uh, you are kind of you enter as sort of the wicked step-parent, or the step-parent entering in and being introduced to the kids. And the kids don't like you because you're the step-parent. And, you know, then you can they get over that initial oh. shock at, at losing the beloved uh, real parent, and then they have to learn to love you. You know what? We're going to have to do the obituary just a little bit and then do, do, it, do it subsequently. In terms of this, 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 this relationship between the, the critic and, and the reader, do you get feedback from the reader? Do you sure. Have, and a lot? Yeah, you get a fair amount of feedback okay. because, as I say, people have uh, people are not as shy about their They're opinions the about opinions. food. I mean, look at the Zayat survey; it's built on the oh, absolutely the, the, uh, the I interest. I got my 2010 just today. The interest that people have in expressing an opinion about where they ate. Okay, let's talk about being an obituary writer, and I've got Bill Keller's memo to the staff when you became the the when it was announced that you were going to become the obituary writer and he quotes Russell Baker and I had never thought about obituary writing let me just quote Baker or Keller quoting Baker oases of calm in a world gone mad stimulants to sweet memories of better times to philosophical reflection to discovery of life's astonishing richness variety comedy sadness of the diverse infinitude of human imagination it takes to make this world what a lovely part of the paper to linger in. I mean, great writing is great writing. Mm -hmm. Talk about, you move from food critic to obituary writing. What, what is it about obit, how did you become the obituary writer? Number, what, are, what are the rewards of doing it? Um, the rewards are other people's lives, which in, 
always turn out to be interesting. It's very hard to lead a, an entirely boring life. Uh, and in fact, if you did lead an entirely boring life, you'd be interesting because you were the one person who lived an entirely right, boring life. Right, this is good. It'd be fascinating for that reason. But generally, the, uh, what they are is small biographies. And generally, they're about people who were of some fame in their own time. And when you begin to look at people's past history before they got into the racket that made them famous, often it turns out to be even more interesting than what they're known for. You must come up with an idea for a biography, either a book or a magazine piece, frequently. I, 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 for example, your November 17, 2009 uh, uh, obit on Bobby Frankel, Training of Championship Horses, dies. Mm -hmm. You gave yourself like a course on all of this and mm -hmm. wrote it every day or every couple of days you write a biography. That's right. It, sometimes you'll do, you know, three or four in the course of a week. And uh, in each case, and, and it can be as different as someone who created a wonder drug, someone who trained horses. Uh, Publishers. Baseball player, Baseball any, players. Matchbook collector. Ozark realists. Ozark, yeah. I mean, I mean, subtle photographer of people. I mean, it's... Yes. So how do you choose them? Well, the editors choose them. The editors are the first line of filtration for uh, who should be in the paper and should be covered. And there's a lot of, uh, you know, some of these things are very obvious. Great statesmen, sure. lies, you write about them. But some of these oddball figures who are just, in fact, in a lot of cases, are much more interesting right. to read about, have done something how very they, strange. How did, they, how did they find out? How did they find it? People they died, did, obviously. Yeah, but, but what yeah, else? you have to hear about it. Sometimes right. you don't hear about it for a while. And uh, their relatives uh, send phone or wow. send an email or you, uh, you, you're dependent on tips in a lot of cases. The wire services, you know, AP sure. will run a wire sure. on uh, some actor, you know, if they have some visibility, the wire services are probably going to have a, at least a notification. We're running out of time. Are these, are some of these obits in the can essentially that people are getting on in age and sure. you've got them archived and you pull them out because sometimes you're doing a two page obit or a page obit mm -hmm. and the, the person died the day before. Obviously, there's homework. Yeah, they have uh, somewhere between 1,000 and 1,500 wow. of those on tap. So that's it. sort of a status symbol to be a, a New York Times obituary, uh, you know, uh, line over here. Well, that's certainly, it, it's, uh, it, it, it argues that you're a substantial figure of some sort if, they've, if you've got one done ahead of time. What's strange is sometimes the obit writer dies before the subject does. You know, they'll be sitting around. Some of these people who look oh. as though they're on their, their last legs aren't at all. I did this one on Studs Terkel about 10 years. He, he went on to live at least another 10 years and write about three more books. So they constantly have to be updated. Okay. My thanks to William Grimes, author of Appetite City, A Culinary History of New York, for being on the show. See you next week. Thank you. Thank you. That was wonderful. Thanks. Hello, I'm Doug Musio. Let us know what you think about this show. You can reach us at cuny.tv. When you get there, click on the bar that says contact us and send your email. Whatever it is, thanks, no thanks, obnoxious, do it. Send it.